So much has happened in the Girardi cases, cases that it's time for a breakdown. Never going to get it, never going to. Not that kind of a breakdown. It's a bit of a road so far, how we even got here and what is happening up until the end of March. Well, almost the end of March because I'm recording before this comes out, but almost the end of March in the Girardi cases. Tom Girardi, famous, fancy LA lawyer, or, you know, house of cards that has crumbled badly and his wife, real housewife of Beverly Hills, Erica Jane. So we are going to go through what has happened, how we got here, and some of the latest things to come out in court filings. It's a lot. I'm going to try to go through it quickly. There are other episodes and other YouTube videos on this linked down below. So if you want the deeper dives, there are lots of them for you. Today is a breakdown. Okay. Okay. We just need to get into it. We just need to get into it. We just need to get into it. Hey there. Welcome to the Emily show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years. I'm a former prosecutor and I'm a big fan of the cursey words. So let's break it down. I've been caught stealing once when I was five. That's that's a quote for today's show, Jane's Addiction. It's just been stuck in my head while I've been prepping this case, so I figured I would just go there. Like, it's terrible. I apologize. But I can't just say it. It has to be sung. <laughs> been caught stealing once when I was five. That's probably better. Either way. <laughs> Jane's Addiction, if you know, you know. I also wanted to bring some comments from YouTube. We've covered a lot of the very kind and amazing, amazing reviews on The Emily Show from iTunes. And I always appreciate your reviews on the podcast, but I also love your comments over on the YouTube. So today there's a few that we're going to highlight. First, Lauren G left the following comment. I'm an enigma wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in a fraudulent financial house of cards. Erica Jane's new Real Housewives of Beverly Hills tagline. I thought it was very clever because I'm an enigma wrapped in a riddle and cash was a previous tagline. And I covered those on one of the older episodes covering this case. Also, Amanda over on YouTube said, proposal for new channel slogan, quote, I have questions. <laughs> and I do. I have a lot of questions about this case. Some of them are starting to get answered. I've asked about like, where is the state bar? And the state bar has stood up and been like, oh, here, we're here, we're here. I mean, I know there's like this whole LA Times article talking about where we've been, but we're here now. We're here. We have things to say, things to say. So I have a lot of questions with this case. And finally, also from YouTube, Tickled Pink Music said, boy, I bet Erica never dreamed this was how her life was going to go when she married an old man millionaire. Agreed, Tickle Pink Music, agreed. I don't think it is. Okay, there's one more. There's one more <laughs> from Lauren G over on YouTube. She said, call me cold, but it's not ice. It's my frozen assets. <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of savage, but it's funny. And again, <laughs> that's another play on a previous tagline of that's not ice, it's diamonds. And of course, because this case involves the allegations that you know, clients haven't been paid. They're not all allegations at this point with like the Rui Gomez family from the PG and E explosion. There are legal judgments. Like, first of all, they were injured. Then they had to sue their lawyer. Then there was a judgment. Then that judgment wasn't being paid. Then there were liens and attachments on all of the real property to get paid the settlement that the company paid to the lawyer to pay to them. So that's not an allegation. They didn't get their settlement. And there are a number of those where it's happened. That is the facts. There are others that are alleged and not proven at this point, but there are definitely those that have been proven in a court of law up until now. So how did we get to where it all falls apart? 
we're going to back up and do a bit of a timeline. And I will link the resources that I have found other than the court records helpful. There's two reporters at the LA Times that have been doing fantastic reporting on this, my opinion, and have really dug into what was the state bar doing? What has been happening? How many old lawsuits there are? Where is the money going? How did Tom Doherty become this power broker in LA? And so for Matt Hamilton and Harriet Ryan, I think those articles have been fantastic for what it's worth, but I've found them very helpful. So there's a number of them from the LA Times, but one of them particularly about how Tom Doherty kind of seduced the state bar and just, just stories of money and political power and parties and extravaganzas and connections, lots and lots of connections made through financial donations and, you know, the expectation of returned favors. So let's back up in time a little bit to what was going on leading up to the filing of the divorce, because the filing of the divorce is really right at the tip of the iceberg of everything that's going on. But leading up to the filing of the divorce in November 2020 were a number of lawsuits, and some of those have judgments, which we will see as we get into the financials from the bankruptcy court. So again, there was this law finance group lawsuit filed in January 2019 that settled in July of 2019 for $6 million. The Rui Gomez stipulated judgment for $11 million in 2019. That is from the individual who was injured in the PG&E explosion and then got a settlement from that. The settlement went to Girardi because it goes to the lawyer. He's supposed to pay it to them. It seems from reporting from their statements that he told them, I'll help you manage the money. I'll hold on to it. I'll give you distributions, you know, on and on and on. When they finally asked for their money, it was like they got a song and dance, didn't get their money, had to sue him, won, then had to try to enforce their judgment, then had to attach all of his personal property. And that's going to come up some more. There is a Stillwell Madsen, which is another loan, like the attorney financing group. That is a $5.8 million judgment that is attached to property. Then there is the security company. They filed a lawsuit in May of 2020 for 53,000 in outstanding unpaid bills. There is a another breach of contract case pending that was filed in 2020 from Azadia, I believe is the proper pronunciation of the last name. There is a law office that sued again over contracts for about $4 million. That was filed in September 2020. There was KCC Class Action Services that actually had a judgment entered in October 2020 for $7.5 million. There is another Selberg case. That's another former client suing for legal malpractice, actually suing Girardi, Girardi Keese, Erica Jane, Erica Jane Global, and EJ Global. So that was filed in October 2020. Then November 3rd, 2020 brings us to the filing of the divorce by Erica Jane. Just about a month before that Edelson PC case is filed. And the Edison PC case in Illinois, again, just for reference, is the law firm that worked with Tom Girardi on the Lion Air disaster that is in federal court in Illinois. Edelson PC filed a lawsuit saying, wait a second, WTF, we think this divorce is a sham. We think that you're trying to move your money around. We think that you need to come to court and explain why these clients haven't been paid. Could you just? And that kind of tipped the wave in the media, my perception of people really taking a look at what was going on, because this complaint kind of laid out the story of what was going on. The story that they believed it looked like Girardi was taking, you know, money from new settlements to pay old creditors, you know, When a lawyer settles a case, the settlement funds go to the lawyer, they take their fees, their expenses, and then the remainder goes to the clients. And that's not what's alleged to have been happening behind the scenes at Girardi Keys for quite some time. The LA Times identified a hundred lawsuits that that firm has been involved in when they were asking like, hey, State Bar, excuse me, excuse me, State Bar, where are you at? What have you been doing? Why has this happened? So that Edelson PC case is still ongoing. Well, as to some of the defendants, because we are now in bankruptcy with Tom Girardi and Girardi Keys, so everything gets stayed or frozen or paused or stopped right there 
because of the bankruptcy. After that December 2nd lawsuit filed by Edelson PC, it seems to me that other creditors were like, OS, we have to get our claims in if we're going to get any money. And it seems to me from everything I've read in this case that Tom Girardi was just juggling the balls of debt here. I mean, there's a joke there about juggling balls. I, we're not going there. We're not going there. I mean, it's not really a family friendly show, but we're still not going there. But was just, you know, telling everybody, oh, well, this next one, it'll come with this next one. We'll get you here. We'll get you there. Don't worry about it. I've got all this money coming in, all these cases coming in, and was doing that on and on and on and trying to get settlements in to cover, like, I'll get you with the next one. I'll get you with the next one. But then COVID shut down the court systems and particularly in LA shut down the court system. Nothing's going to trial. Things aren't settling as quickly. Things are getting pushed out years. And I think it all kind of crumbled in part because of that. Did Erica Jane file for divorce because she knew all this shit was coming down the road? It's unclear to me at this point, but it's possible because then December 9th, the law office of Selberg files lawsuit and Wells Fargo files suit for various debts and breaches of contract. On December 14th, Robert Keese, the business partner from Girardi Keese, who separated from Girardi Keese, sued for back pay. Now, here's the thing with that one. It's interesting because when he left the law firm, according to this lawsuit, it was, hey, I have these other legal fees that are supposed to be coming in. But Tom Girardi, it seemed, agreed to say, okay, well, here's what your monthly payout will be, almost like the retirement fund. So instead of paying you a lump sum when you retire for the legal fees that'll be coming in from work that you've done, it'll be a monthly payment like a retirement payment. And then there was another lawsuit with Keese and a number of others regarding the Wilshire property. It looked like there was supposed to be mutual ownerships in this property and there were supposed to be payouts to the other owners that weren't happening according to that lawsuit. On February 15th, there was an order of attachment issued by the court in the Stillwell Madsen case that was attaching the Wilshire property <laughs> that already has the other lawsuit. And it looks like other loans involved with it. Then on February 18th, the involuntary bankruptcy was filed. And this again is a number of creditors got together, including Robert Keese and said, yo, yo, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of judgments. There seem to be a lot of creditors and there's a lot of lawsuits. This isn't all going to go well. We need to bring it into bankruptcy court. And bringing it into bankruptcy court means it all comes into bankruptcy court. These pending cases come into bankruptcy court. It's all going to get sorted in the bankruptcy court. And the bankruptcy court will prioritize the debts and the secured debts and the non-secured debts and the lawsuits that need to happen or settle and try to resolve everything that's outstanding. So these lawsuits that are outstanding over debts and malpractice and breach of contract are going to get pulled into or swooped, if you will, swooped into the bankruptcy court, which sometimes is used as a strategy see my episode regarding the Boy Scouts of America and their bankruptcy. I talk about it, the strategy of that more in that episode. It'll be linked in the description. January 13th, the bankruptcy is granted for the personal and the business. Now, it's interesting to me that there are two. There's So one for the law firm and one for Tom Jardy as an individual. But the law firm is not under like an LLC or, well, you can't be an LLC as an attorney in California, but not under a professional limited liability company, not under a professional corporation, not under a corporation of any kind, which is interesting to me. And again, could be a professional corporation, could be a corporation, is not a entity, which is so odd to me. But these could have all been done with one, but he's going to be personally responsible for all of these debts. There is no corporation there. It's just him. So at the end of the day, once they settle out the personal stuff, if there is anything, and I don't think there will be, but if there is anything left, the other bankruptcy will have a crack at those assets too. There's no division there. Be very interesting to see what all the finances look like. But in the business bankruptcy, the trustee has said it's going to take at least six months to get cracking on, on those because they have to do the investigation. They've hired accountants and now they have to start to put together where all the money has gone and try to track it down and figure out what's outstanding. 
And that's going to include if the law firm is owed any debts, if the law firm has made any loans, and then the ability to either go track those loans down and have them paid back into the court or sue people over those outstanding balances. So January 13th, the bankruptcy is granted for both the business and the personal. The next day, the next day, Tom Girardi's brother, Robert Girardi, goes to court and is like, yo, um, I would like to be the guardian ad litem for my brother. I would like an opportunity to respond to the bankruptcy. And the court's like, uh, you missed the deadline. Too bad, so sad. We are now officially in bankruptcy. A bankruptcy stay is being issued across all of the other proceedings. That includes the divorce. That includes everything going on in Illinois. Everything stops while the bankruptcy gets resolved. Bankruptcy! It's like that scene out of The Office where Michael Scott's just like, I declare bankruptcy. Everything stops because there is a bankruptcy. All of the other proceedings. On February 1st, the temporary conservatorship is entered in the LA Superior Court and Girardi's brother, who was not appointed as guardian ad litem in the bankruptcy court, is appointed as the temporary conservator. And that has since been extended through June 30th, 2021. They stated that that was due to a medical emergency, but in filings from Tom Girardi's court-appointed attorney, he indicated that Girardi had eye surgery due to pressure in his eye and glaucoma. When I think medical emergency that warrants a conservatorship, that is not something that would come to mind, but we'll see. We'll, we'll get to the medical filings that we've seen in the conservatorship proceedings in a, in a minute because we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. So that was the beginning of February that this temporary conservatorship was ordered. In February 23rd, 2021, there was a bankruptcy hearing regarding the real property. The court ordered the temporary conservator, Robert Girardi, to provide the keys of the Pasadena home, like the codes and things like that, to make the home accessible for showing. They are now getting the Pasadena home that we've seen on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills ready for sale. They've actually filed with the court to have a real estate broker appointed through Compass Realty. And they are getting this house ready to sale, to sale, to sell. <laughs> and when we get to the financials that have been filed, I will give you the estimate of the house. I think it's a, it's a, it's a big estimate for a Pasadena home, but we will see. It's a big, it's a big estimate, big estimate, but we'll get there. The court ordered that the debtor shall cooperate with maintaining the property, not communicating with brokers or buyers, that the utilities should be paid and proof of payment must be submitted to the court, which is interesting because when we get to the property, well, we'll get to taxes. The state of California would like their money, according to the financial filings that are on record so far. And the court made it very clear that any failure to comply will result in eviction. The trustee in bankruptcy went to the court and was like, uh, we can just evict him if we need to sell this house. And Robert Girardi, the brother, was like, no, no, don't, don't, don't evict him. We'll comply with it. So hopefully there won't be an eviction. But if the house goes into escrow, Tom Girardi will have 20 days notice to vacate based on what the court order says. So we get to the end of February and there were rumors that Tom Drody was going to be evicted. And it looked like he wasn't based on the court documents really cooperating well, through his brother. Cause he's not appearing in any of these proceedings. Now he's under conservatorship. He doesn't have the right to make agreements, sign documents. He is stated to be incapable of doing those things. And if we want more discussion from me about conservatorships, see all of my content regarding Britney Spears, where we talk about her conservatorship. But this is not as unusual because this is an 81-year-old individual. There can be mental decline based on age and other factors. What's unusual here, because there are unusual circumstances here, but the unusual circumstances here more relate to the fact that up until just before this, Tom Girardi was still giving speeches and giving presentations and interviews and was still negotiating with Edelson PC, who's actually filed papers in the conservatorship, but we'll talk about that, and was engaging with them in conversation. And the people who engaged with those conversations said there was no indication of any mental decline or issue. There was no rumblings of it and that they had conversations with Tom Girardi that were not concerning. So that is the unusual circumstance here is that this conservatorship and this diagnosis that we'll get to in a few minutes came under such unusual and 
um, consequential circumstances, not that there had been rumblings for a while and that his family had been trying to do anything. This was like, oh, oh, so we're good, but now we're not good now that we've got the court in Illinois asking for a criminal investigation and the court in Illinois, and we didn't get into all of this, the court in Illinois had frozen Tom Doherty's assets. We didn't go through all of that because I went through all that in previous episodes and that has kind of been unwound because now it's in bankruptcy and the bankruptcy kind of takes over everything. So the asset freeze was lifted in Illinois so that the bankruptcy court could take over and do their thing. Either way, there were rumblings about him getting evicted. There's now an agreement for the house to be sold. So that is going to be underway where the bankruptcy trustee is going to start selling off property and other property too, not just the homes, but it will be art, collectibles, jewelry, all the things. I expect that in the next month, the month of April, we will see a lot of activity in that direction within the bankruptcy courts. So that gets us up to March 9th. And I posted about this on social. If you don't follow me on social media and you are on social media, because if you're not on social media, I get it because some platforms can feel very toxic and overwhelming. But if you do follow me on social media at the Emily D Baker, or if you are on social media and don't follow me, you will have seen me posting about this because girl, when this went down, I was like, oh, hey there, State Bar, welcome to the conversation. So on March 9th, 2021, Jordy was ordered inactive and not eligible to practice law by the State Bar of California by way of like an administrative rule because he's under a conservatorship. And when you're under a conservatorship, if you can't take care of yourself, you damn well can't practice law because you don't have mental capacity to take care of yourself. You don't have mental capacity to be a practicing lawyer. I've seen questions and comments about what's going on with the Jordy Keys law firm. And at this point, the law firm is shuttered, it's folded, it's within the bankruptcy. So the existing clients are being, um, having their cases taken over by other attorneys that are having to make agreements with the bankruptcy trustee, because those are assets in the bankruptcy. And yes, it sounds cold to discuss individuals as assets, but it's their cases that are assets in the bankruptcy, because if Girardi Keys did work on these cases. They're entitled to some attorney's fees and costs when the cases settle so that that amount should go into the bankruptcy to help pay the people who haven't recovered. So the attorney's fees will go into the bankruptcy court and then will go to the parties who have not been paid in the order that the bankruptcy court sets. That does not diminish what happens to the current client's funds, they should actually get what they're entitled to after attorney's fees, costs, and what have you, because the split should come from the new attorney and the bankruptcy court. So if anyone's going to get a little bit less, it's either going to be the new attorney or the bankruptcy court, but should not be the individual that's settling their cases because there are still ongoing cases, notably the Porter Ranch cases. So speeding right along to March 10th, there is a report filed in the conservatorship case by Dr. Lavid, indicating that, quote, dementia impairs his ability, his being Girardi, to understand the hearing and stating that Girardi suffers from Alzheimer's disease with late onset. And the report was based on a February 26, 2021 evaluation. Now there have been other issues with this report. There have been questions raised by people objecting to the conservatorship, but we'll get there in a moment. On March 12th, the personal bankruptcy trustee, so the trustee in the personal bankruptcy case, filed a motion to approve a compromise between the trustee and the Rui Gomez creditors, asking the court to approve a essentially compromise or settlement between them. The Rui Gomez creditors, again, come from the PG&E case, and they have a lien of $11,747,245.95 that they are entitled to based on their awarded judgment that was never paid to them by Tom Girardi. And they have a perfected lien against all of his real and personal property, all the shit, all of it. If you sell anything, it goes to us up to 11 million. $747,245.91. So the compromise stated that the sale of property will be distributed as follows. Real property liens senior to the Rui Gomez liens. 
taxes arising from the sale, costs of the sale, administrative fees, and cost of the bankruptcy estate. So the bankruptcy is going to get paid, like the bankruptcy trustee is going to get paid. And then 80% of the balance to the Rui Gomez creditors to be applied towards their claim. So costs, essentially, real property liens that are senior, that would be any lien that came before them or took superiority to them, including potentially a mortgage, potentially including another creditor. There's a footnote about that. We'll see what the court says about that if they approve this compromise, because this is a proposal. This is a, hey, we'd like to do this. And we'll see that there's objections to it in just a moment. But essentially costs, administrative fees, taxes, and then 80% of what's left goes to the Rui Gomez creditors. 20% of what's left will be held by the trustee for other unsecured claimants in the bankruptcy estate. The Rui Gomez creditors can still go after whatever property is attached or sold off with regard to Girardi Keys. So they have both opportunities to be made whole. They're not going to double dip, obviously, but they have two opportunities to be made whole to that 11747000 some odd dollars that they are owed. Also on March 12th, in the conservatorship, the state bar objected to the conservatorship and asked for a neutral medical review and an evidentiary hearing. Now, I have video breaking this down, but the state bar is like, hey, it's our job to protect the public. And I'm like, where you been? But where have you been? But where have you been? And it's interesting because this kind of came on the heels of the LA Times article. I think the timing might wholly be coincidental, but it was still funny. So the state bar is saying, could you please at least grant a neutral medical review and an evidentiary hearing? We object to you just placing him under conservatorship. And the state bar really said, we want an opportunity to go through the punishment proceedings under the state bar. He's under investigation. And this is the first time we've actually heard the state bar say he's under active investigation. In their filings, the state bar also said, hey, he was trying to negotiate with us up until this conservatorship happened, trying to work with us regarding this investigation. So very, very interesting document filed by the state bar asking for that neutral medical review and evidentiary hearing. I mean, it's been objected to, but we'll get there. On March 15th, the conservator, so the attorneys for Tom Girardi's brother, Robert Girardi, the conservator, filed a response to the state bar objection, saying that the state bar has no standing. Like, you don't go here. You can't bring a claim here. You have no interest here. GFO. Like, just get out. You you can't do what you're trying to do. You don't have any right to come into court and object. Just out. Yeet. Yeet. <laughs> yes. I just did say in the capacity or in the context of law that the conservator or the attorney for the conservator wants to yeet the state bar out of the conservatorship proceeding. I said that. I stand by it. Y'all know what I mean. Or at least the millennials and, and Gen Z of you. I doubt any of you are Gen Z that are listening, but I, I you get what I mean. The boomers, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeet means DM me. It means throw. <laughs> so in the response saying that the state bar doesn't even go here, the state bar doesn't have standing here, the state bar shouldn't be speaking up in this. They also said that the state bar's request goes against the purpose of conservatorship. Like the conservatorship purpose is to protect the conservatee, Tom Girardi, and that the state bar is seeking to harm the conservatee, essentially, Tom Girardi. Like they are seeking to punish him, but the goal of the conservatorship is to protect him. So they're asking for something that goes directly against the purpose here. But what's interesting to me is that the response included letters between Robert Girardi and the state bar. And I was like, oh, T, let's see what these two are saying to each other. So Robert Girardi wrote to the state bar and attempted to relinquish Tom Girardi's license to practice law. He actually said he wanted to, quote, tender Tom's resignation from the state bar and relinquish his rights to practice law. It's like, hey, can we just get, like, we don't need to be licensed anymore. Can we just give that back? Will that make you stop investigating him? Because 
if he's no longer a member of the bar, there's no need to investigate him for disciplinary action, right? The state bar is having literally none of it at this point. I don't know, again, if the state bar is like righteously outraged now that they've seen everything that went down for all these years, or if the LA Times article put a bug in their ass about it. But I imagine if you worked at the state bar and we're seeing all this go down and the people who were seemingly complicit in this are long gone or retired, you'd be like, seriously, guys, WTF, this is so shady. I'm angry. Like something needs to be done. We look horrible here. This is exactly what we're supposed to prevent from happening. This is literally our purpose in life is to make sure this shit doesn't happen and it happened. I'd be pissed. I'd be so pissed. Either way, the bar responded, no, actually, you can't do that. There is a proper procedure to resign if you're under investigation, but it includes a detailed written stipulation that then has to be accepted by the Supreme Court of California. So what we're not going to do is go ahead and accept this letter that you sent us saying he'd like to just turn in his law license. Please make it stop. Though if he's given a, you know, permanent conservatorship, it's going to be a little bit harder for the state bar to discipline him because he will be under a conservatorship and there's not much. He can't participate in that. There's nothing really he would be able to do at that point. Then... <laughs> Same day, we're still March 15th. A lot of shit got filed. We're still March 15th. A statement of appointed counsel. Now, remember, what we all know from the Britney Spears conservatorship is that Britney doesn't get to hire her own attorney. The court appoints an attorney for the conservatee. And that's what happened in this case. The conservatee's attorney, Tom Girardi's court-appointed attorney, filed his you know, statement, essentially, with the court. He indicated in the statement that one, he wasn't going to spill all the tea because he realizes that sharing things that he and Tom Girardi talked about in a court record could potentially impact things going on in other cases because there are so many other cases. So he definitely made note of the fact that there were these other proceedings going on and he didn't want to put anything on the record in the conservatorship that could impact those. He also said that Girardi was essentially living independently and I am confusion. And that his daughter drops off dinner and checks on him. He has a housekeeper and groundkeeper and an assistant from the law firm who still helps out. But essentially, he's living independently with no like live-in medical help or anything like that. And I'm like, but he needs a conservatorship, you're saying. And if he needs a conservatorship, then he can't live independently. The court-appointed attorney pointed out under probate code section 1801, subject to probate code 18.3, that, quote, a conservator of the person may be appointed for a person who is unable to provide properly for his or her personal needs for physical health, food, clothing, or shelter, except as provided for by another subsection, and providing that, quote, a conservator of the estate may be appointed for a person who is substantially unable to manage his or her own financial resources or resist fraud or undue influence except as provided for that person as described in subdivision B or C, substantial inability may not be provided solely by isolated incidents of negligence or imprudence, essentially. But here's the thing. Is he? <laughs> and that is the question. Is he, though, if he's living independently with somebody dropping off dinner once a day, is he unable to provide for himself? So there's that. The statement also goes on to say that Girardi was unable to appreciate the nature of all of the other legal proceedings going on and that he was unable to kind of grasp the gravity, essentially, of what was happening. The court-appointed attorney recommended granting the petition for conservatorship and notes that the objecting parties have remedies outside of the conservatorship proceeding. Now, after that, Edelson PC also objected to the conservatorship on much the same grounds as the state bar saying, oh, by the way, we were negotiating with him. He was giving speeches. He was giving, you know, teaching MCLEs, continuing legal education courses, and doing all of this other stuff right up until this, and it seems sus to us. So we now have two objections to the conservatorship, one from the state bar, one from Edelson PC. Later on, the attorneys for 
the conservator, Robert Girardi, object again on much the same grounds as they did to the state bar saying, you don't have standing here. The point of the conservatorship is to protect him, yada, blah, et cetera. Then we're going to hop back over to the bankruptcy court. On March 19th, Karen Girardi, the first wife, because Erica Jane is the third wife. There's a middle wife as well. But Karen Girardi filed a motion in objection to the compromise with regard to the Rui Gomez creditors, saying essentially, oh, by the way, court and trustee, I get $10,000 a month in spousal support, and that hasn't been getting paid. So if you're going to sell all of this property and give these creditors 80% of it, you also have to carve out an allotment for my $10,000 a month because I'm owed that. And oh, by the way, I haven't been getting that. So I'm owed over $70,000 at this point in back payments. It would sure be great if you could go ahead and meet the um, expectations and the court-ordered spousal support that I'm entitled to until Tom Girardi dies. And even then, I have a life insurance policy out on him. So yeah, could you just? So that was the first objection filed. Then came the limited objection of Erica Jane. And I refer to her as Erica Jane just because sometimes it's Erica Girardi, sometimes it's Erica Jane, sometimes it's just Erica. Uh, it just, it's easier for me to refer to her as Erica Jane. And she's filing for divorce. So that's what we're going with. We're going with her state name. But she also filed a limited opposition to the motion to approve the compromise, claiming a homestead exemption and others. Essentially, what this means is Erica's attorneys have gone into the bankruptcy court, the personal one, and said, hey, Erica is still the spouse, right? Because the divorce is frozen. That hasn't been finalized. Erica is still the spouse. And as the spouse, she's entitled to certain exemptions under the bankruptcy code. Now, the exemptions mean monies that go back to the people in bankruptcy and not to the payment of creditors. So her asking for these exemptions to be carved out has not sat well with the public. The PR on this is terrible. The law on this is in her favor. However, however, the biggest exemption there is the homestead exemption with regard to this Pasadena house. Well, from everything I've looked at in this, it seems that the Pasadena house is not community property in this case. Her name doesn't seem to be on the property. She was not married to Tom when he acquired the property. The property is discussed in the first divorce that took place in the late 80s, the one with Karen, who's asking for her $10,000 a month. And again, no shade to Karen. That's her spousal support agreement. She's legally entitled to it. It's just with everything going on. I, I mean, I don't... I don't know. I don't know if that's what you choose to do, but it's her legal right to do so. So again, the things sometimes that feel gross and you're like, why would you do that? Still legal. You're, these are legal rights. People are allowed to make this choice. Either way, Erica, the homestead exemption. It'll be interesting for me to see what the court does with this because that might not be community property. That might just be Tom's property, which means if Tom gets a homestead exemption, it wouldn't necessarily go to Erica. It would go back potentially into, depending on the amount, it could go end up going back into the bankruptcy for the law firm. If there's $600,000 sitting around that came from the homestead exemption, could the bankruptcy court for the law firm be like, you don't need $600,000 to live on? Maybe not. We'll see. But I don't know if that money will go to Erica per se, because I don't think she has an interest in the home based on the fact that it's not community property. But Tom Girardi has not raised his exemptions yet, and Tom Girardi has not shown up in the bankruptcy court and objected to this compromise asserting his own exemptions. There's still some time for him to do that. I don't know if he will, and him through his, at this point, through the lawyers for his brother, the conservator. We'll see if they choose to do that or not. Then on March 24th, the trustee in the individual bankruptcy case filed their summary of financial assets and liabilities 
in court. This is not a complete summary in that there are quite a lot of things that say financial records still under review. So there are still quite a lot of unknowns when it comes to things like jewelry. It's like amount unknown, clothing, amount unknown, collectibles, things like art, amount unknown. But I've watched a lot of Real Housewives and I know some of that shit exists. I want to know how much that Cartier Jaguar ring's worth, right? She said Tom bought it for her. That's community property. I want to know. But none of that is listed here yet there will be updates to this as it continues going. But the initial financials indicate that the assets are at $74.4 million in assets. No, I didn't misspeak. Yes, I am both ADHD and dyslexic, but that number is that number. $74.4 million in assets. Now, I think this number is a bit skewed, and I will tell you why in a moment. When it came to liabilities, the liabilities stated are $56.8 million in liabilities. Yup. Yup. I want to tell you briefly where those assets are coming from and where some of those liabilities are coming from. So the main asset is the home, and the home is listed, well, they're saying they believe the total amount of real estate is worth $17.6 million. And that $17.6 million is coming from the Pasadena property valued at $16.5 million. We'll see. Like, here's why I say we'll see. Because we've seen both like Shane Dawson, Jeffree Star, and others who are selling off their homes during this time in that over two, $3 million range, selling them for less than what they bought them for. I believe even the Westbrook's house, no, the Westbrook's house sold for a little bit more in that lawsuit. When we were looking, the Westbrook's house came up in the, the without a crystal ball lawsuit. We've talked about it either way. Most seem to have been selling their houses in that multi-million real estate market for less than they purchased them for just a few years ago. So I'm sure this property has increased in value since it was purchased in, you know, what the seventies, I think, but I don't know if that's going to actually sell for 16.5 million. It hasn't been listed yet. When it is listed, I'm sure you will see it in the news cycle, what they list it for. I'm very curious. And then there's another $1.1 million property in Riverside. So that's where that $17.6 million number comes from. Other assets are listed as personal property, but $50 million of that or 51 million of that $56 million number is a loan that Tom Girardi allegedly made to his own law firm, Girardi Keys. I have so many questions. $50 million. He loaned his business $50 million. His business is now in bankruptcy and it's not going to pay him back. But I don't think that's an asset. I don't think we're collecting on that money. So when I say I think that the assets number is off, um, I think that $51 million loan is a loss at this point. But it was listed. I have questions. I want to know where the trustee found it. I want to know about the documents. I want to know why in the fuck. What? 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 $50 million. What? What? I have questions. So that's essentially what makes up the bulk of those assets. And then with regard to the liabilities, the largest liability is the $11 million plus Rui Gomez lien. But there's also a $5 million lien from the Franchise Tax Board. That's California's own tax arm. So if you owe over $5 million in state taxes, I would like to talk to the IRS. IRS, Hi, you here yet? When are you coming in? I'm curious what you have to say, because I imagine that the IRS is going, oh shit, if there's any tax liabilities owed, um, we need to get in on that. So I imagine we'll see if there are any taxes owe the IRS soon, because the IRS, one thing is for certain, they will get their money or they will try to get their money. So I believe if there is anything to be said that the IRS will probably come a knocking in this bankruptcy as well saying, oh, by the way, this is how much is owed to us. Other things of note in these financials, there is a bank account that was identified that has $5 million just chilling in it. So there's that. But then you also have like, look, the business isn't a separate entity. There's this bank account with $5 million chilling in it. And all hell broke loose 
in Illinois over what looks like $2 million. Why don't you just pay it? And some of these other debts, there's like a vet bill for a oh, like an equine doctor and gardeners and the laundry service and shit. Like, why aren't we just paying? You have $5 million in the bank and these bills aren't getting paid. I have questions because of course, from pulling the credit report, they've listed all of the back payments that are due on the leased cars, which he's not going to be driving because conservatorship with regard to the lapsed payments, the payment to the franchise tax board, the payment to the vet, the payment to this and to that. But also the last thing of interest in this form is the schedule of income. And they talk about the current income, which they have listed at $2,958 a month coming from social security So there's the current income, but they also listed income from the last two years. We're going to have questions about this as well. I can't, I mean, just being nosy, I'm interested to see what else gets filed with regards to these financials because where the money went has become the question that is most prevalent on my mind. But for the tax year of 2019, the indication from these filings from the bankruptcy trustee, again, who put them together through their own investigation, not with Tom Girardi. Tom Girardi did not file his financials in this bankruptcy case. And at the uh, the signature box indicates that there was help gathering information from the conservator, Robert Girardi. But also Robert Girardi, when he filed to be guardian ad litem, said, look, this is going to take me time because my brother's been very guarded about money. It's very complex and I don't know where everything is. So for what it's worth. It indicated 34,000 in income from social security, 32,000 in income from interest, 10,000 from dividends and 16.9 million dollars in long-term capital gains. 820,000 in rent royalties or partnership income. So, what was getting sold for that 16.9 million dollar number in 2019? And where did it go? And where did it go? Did that money get loaned out? I mean, if that money got loaned out to, maybe it's part of the 50 million that got loaned back into the law firm, but if that money got loaned out external to the law firm, the bankruptcy trustee can try to go after those loans getting paid back and sue people because the bankruptcy trustee is allowed to sue people. The 2018 year was a little bit different with 32,000 coming from social security, 13,000 coming from interest, 40,000 coming from dividends and 1.7 million in capital gains, rents or royalties. The $16.9 million in long-term capital gains in 2019 is very curious to me. And I will be interested to see if more information comes out about it. I know there's been lots of conversation about this schedules of assets and liabilities. The trustee did list Erica Girardi as a co-debtor on quite a lot of these debts saying, look, you're married. These are his debts. These are your debts too, boo-boo. So do I think that the bankruptcy trustee at some point will sue Erica Jane if there's any loans that have been given to her company? Yes. Do I think marital assets and community property will be sold off in this? Yes. Do I have any thoughts on how much Erica knew? Not yet, but there's a lot here. And I don't know. I really don't know what Erica knew at this point. And as more information comes out, I'm open to change my mind and say, nope, these things indicate to me that she knew. But there's a part of my gut that's just like, look, she was going, if the money still spends, I'm not asking questions. And when Tom and I talk, we talk about light and fluffy things. And he bought me the ring I tracked down. And it's all good. It's all good. I got to fly on the plane. I got to do this. I got to do that. Everything's everything's great. I got to write my book. Tom lets me perform. I don't ask him questions. He doesn't ask me questions. And that's how it works. I'll be very interested to see what she says about it in season 11 of The Real Housewives. The bankruptcy court has filings, so many filings. And that's where we're really going to see the most activity in the bankruptcy courts and in the conservatorship proceeding. The cases in Illinois are going to keep going because There are other attorneys from the Girardi Keys firm involved in those and discovery motions are ongoing to try to depose those attorneys, see what they knew, see why they didn't say anything to the court if the clients hadn't been paid, et cetera. So there are other attorneys looped into this, including Tom Girardi's son-in-law, whose last name is Lyra. So 
We will see what happens with regard to the other attorneys in the Illinois Lion Air cases. And I will continue to keep an eye on what's going on in the bankruptcy court because week over week, it's a lot happening. And as we learn more through these different filings, I will be here to talk about it with you. I'm very curious to see if an evidentiary hearing and an independent doctor's evaluation is granted based on the objections of Edelson PC and the State Bar of California. I would love to know your thoughts on all of this. It's been a wild ride with this case, just wild. So let me know your thoughts either on social media or in the comments down below. If you have questions about this case, tag me, ask me. I'm here to have a conversation about this. It's wild stuff, you guys. At the end of the day, I'm angry that this is happening. I'm angry that the state bar never stepped in. I'm angry seeing things like, you know, the LA Times breaking down that in time, Girardi, his family and employees donated more than $7.3 million to political candidates. So, you know, at some point, the Rui Gomez family and others are not getting their settlements. But over $7 million has gone out the door to political campaigns. And he's hosting Biden for breakfast at the Jonathan Club. Well, there are individuals who relied on him to make it right for them, not having justice done for them. It just boggles my mind and infuriates me on behalf of all of the clients who should have been able to trust their attorney because you should be able to trust your attorney to do what's best and to do what's ethical and to do what's legal. And for all of the clients that are still going through this, they're watching, you know, Erica just post on social media, like nothing has changed in her life. And they're watching, you know, Tom Girardi, some believe use the conservatorship as a way to hide himself from criminal liability, potentially, and from other liability. It's not going to hide him from the shame of all of this. It's not going to hide him from the fact that he's been stripped of awards and honors and all of that, because this is just one of the most outrageous things I've seen. And this story is going to be a long one till we know how it resolves, but we're going to be here talking about it for as long as it takes. And I'm sure that someone at Netflix or somewhere is already trying to track down these clients and talk to them about what their experience was like trying to get their money back from Tom, trying to go through the court process and then have all of this come screeching into a bankruptcy case in the middle of it. I want to hear their stories. I'm sure you want to hear their stories and I want to see where this goes. We're here to do that. But we're still also in the middle of a pandemic, so raise a glass and say it with me. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your family be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. Thank you for being here with me for another one. I look forward to talking to you again next week. Have a good one. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube. But in filings from, from Tom Girardi's with 820, uh, nope, I already said that number. The cases in Illinois are still on go in Illinois. Good Lord. Yeah, I know it's Illinois. Sometimes it happens. <laughs>